delegates elected to serve 2.1 million members from the U.S., Canada, and Puerto Rico. I see the front lines of property services, working people that are proud to do their work every morning despite these incredibly tough times. I see the rainbow of our world. Black, brown, white, Asian, Native American, immigrant from all nations of the world, retirees, millennials, women, men, lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgendered, and straight, Republicans, independents, Democrats, every religious belief, each of us bringing our respective strengths from our identities, from our customs and cultures into this incredibly proud and strong national leadership team, a united force for change. I am so proud to stand before you today as the first woman to be elected president of SEIU. I know that I do not stand here alone. I stand on the shoulders of many of you who gave me a hand up, and you and I stand on the strong shoulders of people that came before us. You people who had the guts to act from a belief that all people deserve dignity and respect. People who had guts to stick their necks out and form a union and say, I am worth something. I deserve better. Our union was born out of that belief from immigrant flat janitors in 1902 on the south side of Chicago who stood up to their tenant owners and said, enough is enough. We deserve better. Our union was stands on the shoulders of brewery workers from Toronto in 1904 who said, enough is enough. We deserve to be treated better than the horses that deliver the beer. We stand on the shoulders of the brave men and women in Puerto Rico, who in 1989 stood up to the corporate allied government and had 200,000 people pour into the streets to defend working families and all of us to fight for a better Puerto Rico. We stand, on the shoulders, we stand on the shoulders of immigrant clothing and textile workers in Chicago, Patterson, New Jersey, and New York City, who said one day, we are not going to allow another worker to lose their life to, in the service of the profits of those owners. I am so proud to be part of a union that lives the values of our founders. Dignity, respect, equality, and justice. Those values are embedded in all of the accomplishments we've been celebrating this morning at this convention. Our public service members have been trying against the odds to maintain effective public services in cities and schools and clinics and parks and so many other settings. They've been standing up against right-wing attacks to take away their voice. And even as these attacks intensify, our public service division is reaching out to non-union workers who are develop serving the developmentally disabled, mental health care, higher education, and child care, so that non-union workers can have a voice, too, in the services they deliver. 
the entire SEIU family should be incredibly proud that our public service members fight all across North America and Puerto Rico to get the 1% to invest in a government that works for working people. Thank you, public service members. Our health care members led the fight to extend health care insurance to 31 million more Americans in 2010. Yeah, that is a big deal. And today, the rest of the SEIU family needs to have the backs as our, of our health care members who are on the front lines working to protect, defend, and expand the Affordable Care Act. They have linked arms with our brothers and sisters in Canada who are fighting right-wing efforts to also erode the universal health care coverage that our Canadian brothers and sisters have fought for and won decades ago. But our entire SEIU family can be incredibly proud of the doctors, registered nurses, respiratory therapists, technical workers, service workers, nursing home workers, home care workers, who are fighting to create a 21st century healthcare system that will get all of us healthy and bring down costs and ensure that each and every human being gets the care they deserve. Our property services division continues to defy the odds by taking on the 1% and winning good jobs in bargaining this past year for 150,000 janitors. <laughs> we have a union just a few years ago and they will be joined by 50,000 more security officers over the next four years. That's a remarkable achievement. Our union can be incredibly proud. That private sector security officer campaign could be one of the largest private sector organizing campaigns in the next four years, and it will lift minimum wage, no benefit jobs into family wage jobs that people can raise their families on. Our South Southwest locals grew by 90,000 workers thanks to the national commitment we all made in 2004, combined with the blood, sweat, and tears of the South Southwest leadership in this room. Our entire union can be proud of the leaders with the yellow scarves who are organizing and building the union in the toughest turf in the country. We salute the South Southwest locals. Our political program continues to grow with member leaders expanding their development, cope sign-ups increasing, and members stepping up to run for office. We've continued to expand our union's commitment to making sure we are lifting up and empowering the voices of our Latino, African American, and Asian Pacific Islander communities, those communities that need to have the force of say in our democracy. And for the first time ever, we are building a political program in Puerto Rico around the Puerto Rico vision for a civil society. Our leaders in Canada are mobilizing entire provinces around our health care, our vote. And our entire union can take great pride in the all-out effort that is underway right now to galvanize millions of voters on the issues that our communities care about to re-elect President Barack Obama in 2012. Now, in 2011, a year during the worst attack on workers' organization in the U.S. in our generation, our union, 
grew by 57,000 new members. And we celebrated earlier, but let's do it again at our family reunion. We brought in 293,000 more workers over the past four years to our great family. And the amazing thing about our family is we made those gains even as we retooled our organizing program to try and meet this incredibly important historic moment. We redeployed resources to a multi-city strategy called the Fight for a Fair Economy that has already helped to change the debate and joined with the Occupy movement in changing the national conversation. Time and again, when somebody says, oh, that can't be done, SEIU makes it happen. We have a track record of success. We're entitled to have a little bit of swag. Yeah. <laughs> and that is a tribute to each and every one of the member leaders in this room. You created that track record of success. And it's a tribute to millions more at home. But it's also a tribute to two leaders who helped build the modern SEIU. In 1984, a local union president in Pennsylvania at Local 668 was recruited, all right, 668, was recruited by then International President John Sweeney to be the SEIU organizing director. SEIU had 800,000 members when he started as organizing director. And when he left as international president, SEIU had 2.1 million members. He led us through bold action, through to New Strength Unity, a program that transformed SEIU into the fastest growing union in North America. He opened up many new friends, like global organizing and an investment in the South Southwest. His presidency hardwired risk-taking and organizational change into our union. He played a leading role in our union's successful fight to win the Affordable Care Act. He called on us time and again by asking, if not us, then who? If not now, then when? I'm so proud that Andy Stern could be with us here today. As Andy Stern led the transformation of our union, Anna Berger strengthened it. As Secretary Treasurer, Anna's leadership improved innumerable corners of SEIU. But her signature contribution was the expansion of our union's national political program. It is because of her tireless dedication and her incredible tenacity in insisting that workers' voices be heard in our democracy that our union is today known as a respected advocate of working people. I am so proud that Anna Berger, Berger could be with us here today. Now, brothers and sisters, it's up to us to put the assets of this incredible organization to use in the service of a mission to create a path to a just society. Each of you has been elected 
to set the direction of this union for the next four years. And I believe the decisions we make at this convention will determine the future for the next generation. That direction can, needs to get set through the debate and discussion here. We know what the problems are working people face today. Our communities are at the epicenter of the crisis. We don't need research and polling to know what the problems are. We see it in the eyes of our children. We see it in the eyes of our parents. And you know it from the people that you serve every day. The gap between the rich and everyone else grew because of a 40-year coordinated attack from the right wing to take from the 99% and give to the 1%. The system is rigged in favor of the rich. Our democracy is broken. The 1% is trying to dismantle any form of worker organization that can resist their agenda. In the past year, 2.5 million workers, collective bargaining rights have been taken away or dues stopped or elimination of a say in the democracy. Hundreds of thousands of women could lose access to health care this year if policies that are being passed in states go into effect. Five million people have been struck from the voter rolls in the United States of America, struck as a result of laws requiring photo ID. This means that the communities that made a decisive difference in 2008 election mostly poor, elderly, mostly African-American, mostly Latino voters will now have to jump through hoops just to exercise a right to vote that people died for years ago. Our environmental protections, our LGBT non-discrimination, they're all getting rolled back. And you and I both know this is just the tip of the iceberg. And these are not random acts. We are seeing the culmination of a 40-year coordinated plan energized by a Supreme Court decision that allows the 1% to buy an unfair tax system, to finance a relentless attack on all of us and our communities, to drain our public education system, and to um, dismantle and destroy workers' organizations. The Wisconsin governor, Scott Walker, <laughs> says in a new video that the strategy of the right is to divide and conquer. Now, did they have to make a video to explain that to us? <laughs> Walker and his pals are stepping up their divide and conquer tactics by using the use of race as a fault line to divide us. From thinly veiled racist attacks on our president to the demonizing and racial profiling of immigrants in Arizona, South Carolina, Georgia, and Alabama. We've also seen the Republican candidates fight, not for a better future for all working families in this country, but to see who can outdo each other, to see who can be the most anti-immigrant. Our union fiercely opposes these actions, and we will fight to eliminate racism. Our union fiercely opposes these actions, and we will fight to eliminate racism because it's the right thing to do and because it's required for all of us to win together. Scott Walker knows, just as the right knows, that if we, all of us, could unite to create one forceful justice movement, they would be out of business. And you know why, because there's more of us than there are of them.